This season of the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast is proudly brought to you by Casio Electronic Music Instruments. We have to get the repertoire choices right. That is essentially what is going to keep our students learning piano. It doesn't matter how fantastic the teacher is. It doesn't matter how supportive the parent is. If they don't like the pieces they're playing, they won't want to play. Welcome to the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast, the place where teachers from around the world meet to share innovative ideas about music education. Listen and learn as we help you motivate your students, grow your income, expand your studio, and become a more creative piano teacher. G'day, everyone, and welcome back to the final episode of Season 1, 2018 of the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast. You're listening to episode number 124, and if you're one of my Inner Circle Piano Teaching community members, then a very special welcome to you. My name is Tim Topham, your host for the show, and if this is your first time here, or even if it's your 100th time here, or maybe your 124th time here, then thank you so much for tuning in. I do hope you're really enjoying this series uh, and also this season and my change to running some shorter seasons in 2018. The Creative Piano Teaching Podcast is, of course, the place where you can get your hit of weekly inspiration, ideas, business, and teaching strategies to help support and grow your teaching and your studio. Today's show notes and transcript are available as usual at this this address, timtopham.com slash episode 124. All right, well, this is sadly the last episode of season three and it's all, season one, sorry, and it's also the last part in our motivation series, mini series with Samantha Coates. Uh, and as you can tell, I've thoroughly enjoyed hanging out with both her and you guys as we've unpacked one of the big issues for teachers around the world. And that's the idea of motivating students, getting them involved, keeping them practicing and keeping them in their studio. So in today's episode part three, we're going to be unpacking the three basic needs of all piano students and talking about how this can impact, how a knowledge of this can impact positively the way you set goals and the way you choose repertoire for your students. Here's my interview with Samantha Coates. Samantha Coates, welcome back. I'm I'm actually quite sorry that this is the last of our three part series. I'm going to miss speaking to you. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> we'll catch up again, I'm sure, at some conference or other somewhere in the world. Uh, so this is part three, everyone, of our motivation series with the fantastic Samantha Coates. Last week, we explored the impact of parents on music education and learnt some ways to get the best out of students by actually motivating the parents. If if you haven't thought about this, then I'll tell you what, there were some amazing ideas that came out of episode two. So make sure you go back and listen to that if you haven't listened to it already. It's episode number 124 and it was produced last week. So today we're exploring what Samantha calls the three basic needs of all piano students. And as she teased last episode, it's to do with something called self-determination theory. Samantha, is that right? That is right, which, as I said last week, sounds all very fancy schmancy. It but, sounds a little um, bit scary, but I'm sure you will uh, iron it all out and make it really easy for us to understand. <laughs> so yes. should, we, uh, should we just step through those three needs? Yes, and I've called it the three basic needs of all piano students, but it's actually the three basic needs of all human beings. These are your three basic psychological needs, and they are autonomy, competence and relatedness right so um, if we just think about this in in terms of our ourselves for a moment and our our day-to-day -day jobs uh, just what we do so everybody wants autonomy in their lives if you feel that you're constantly under somebody's control or that you never get to make your own decisions you're not going to be happy you're going to want to change that at some stage. Autonomy is really important. Then competence. We do need to feel a sense of mastery of what we do. We don't want things to be so hard, so difficult that we can't get there. But we also don't want things to be too easy. If we're doing a job that's just too easy and boring, then we're, we're going to get bored with that after a while. Competence is really important and we need to have um, – 
uh, like a, a gold, Goldilocks task. I was they, just they thinking of Goldilocks. Really, <laughs> yes. We don't want them to be too easy and we don't want them to be too hard. We want them to be just right. And then there's relatedness. So we need to have a sense of social relevance in our lives, a sense of purpose in what we do. Why are we doing what we're doing? If we're missing relatedness in in what we do and purpose, then that activity starts to lose its meaning. So there are three basic psych- psychological needs that are talked about as part of self-determination theory. Mm-hmm. And the wonderful Gary McPherson that we talked about lots last week that wrote the book Music in Our Lives and who ran the longitudinal study, he he delved a lot into self-determination theory uh, when looking at these band students. And it's Richard Ryan and Edward Desi, actually, who talk about, the two psychologists that talk about self-determination theory. And there's a really fantastic quote, actually, uh, by Edward Desi, and that is, I'm just trying to find this fantastic quote. Um, yes, it's not your job to motivate students. It is your job to create the environments in which students will motivate themselves. Okay, you better give that one to us all again. Okay, it is not your job to motivate students. It is your job to create the environments in which students will motivate themselves. Right. And what they're saying is that we need to create for our students autonomy, competence, and relatedness. Okie dokie. All right. So it's not our job to motivate students, but instead create the environments in which they can motivate themselves. And the ways to do that are via your three aspects of the needs, the autonomy. So having choice over their destiny or the, what they're doing, having yes. Goldilocks um, tasks to do, not too hard, not too easy, but ones they can master and making sure that things have relevance, relevancy and purpose. Have I summed that up right? Yes, that is exactly right. And just to be clear, these are not these are not really mine. Like I've called it the three basic needs of all piano students. But but as I said, it's really Edward Desi and Richard Ryan. That these are the three basic needs of all human beings. Mm. Um, But if we look at it in the context of our studios and in the context of, let's say, rewards, uh, uh, which we talked about in in the first episode on Mm -hmm. this, we want rewards or goals even for our students to address at least one of these three basic needs. So if they are trying to learn, let's say, 40 pieces in a year, the 40-piece challenge, let's say, which is a fantastic challenge for our piano students, then that that addresses a few of these things. It certainly addresses competence. Uh, most of the goals that we would have for our students would address competence and we want to give them achievable goals. But we also need to address autonomy and relatedness. So in terms of autonomy, let them choose perhaps how many pieces they think they can master in a year. Mm-hmm. Not it, it, may, it may be less than 40. It may be more than 40. Um, and later this episode, we'll talk about repertoire, how it's really important to let them choose their repertoire. But to have goals um, also give them a sense of purpose, they need to understand why. Why are they doing a 40-piece challenge? We know all the reasons. It's because they're going to become fabulous sight readers. It's because they're going to become too exposed to so many styles. And they're important things for becoming a musician. If we don't tell our students why, they are doing this, then they don't have an understanding of the higher purpose of it all. Um, another way we can um, use something like the 40-piece challenge to to address relatedness is to have a chart on the wall where, and I've seen a lot of teachers do this, and post pictures of their studio like competitions to see mm. how many pieces everybody's learned. That addresses relatedness. It There can be individual challenges or group challenges, but when when there's a group challenge, then people get a sense of working together, and that's really really important. Mm. That's, so that's a great example for relatedness because I was thinking more about making things relevant and understandable of why, but you're actually talking about there that seeing other people doing the same things can be a motivating factor too. Yes, absolutely. It's it's the really it's. It's the social aspect of it and a need to know that other people are, are doing this too and why are they doing it too? Mm, right. Where do they get out? 
Um, yeah, but in terms of our students and, and why they might give up their in instrument, why they might start to lose motivation, usually it can be related to one of these three psychological needs. So, for example, if a student, um, this was, was some of the quotes that came up in Gary McPherson's study, uh, post-learning. So one student said, I felt like I was forced to play it in the first place and then forced to practice music that was not of my choosing. Um, big one. So, yep. Yeah, that's a big one for autonomy. There was autonomy lacking in that student's music education. And so they ended up giving giving up because everything was out of their control. There wasn't there wasn't a choice to play that particular music. Mm. Or um, students who learn instruments but then can't get to be with their peers. So one student in a post interview said, I continued to play the clarinet in high school but felt it isolated me socially. None of her friends were playing mm. clarinet. Right. And so you can give up because of uh, the reason of relatedness as well. So your social positioning uh, can play a huge part. And this is where it's harder for piano teachers than any other. I was going to say, piano, yeah. piano is solitary. But, um, and we can address this though in the choice of repertoire, playing pop songs, learning to read chord charts, getting them to play duets and try to play in ensembles and, and be the keyboard player in a band does a lot to go towards relatedness. It's mm. really important. And the other, the other opportunity teachers have there is to teach in groups, if not all the time in groups, but to have group sessions where groups of students come together for an hour on a weekend to do a, an activity or something like that, I guess. Yes, it is a marvelous way to teach. Uh, group teaching uh, has uh, like varied, is varied in its reputation. I am, I run, I teach group classes once a week at Australian music schools, which um, used to be a Yamaha school. Uh, so I'm Yamaha trained and uh, I think it's fantastic when um, there's groups of students who sing together and play by ear and they have wonderful oral uh, capacity and they their musicianship is superb and they have a fantastic social time but there are limitations when you teach in a group for sure you you cannot address everybody's technique as you would like mm. you are usually limited with your instruments because of course in a group situation you're playing on digital keyboards you cannot have 12 acoustic pianos in the room uh <laughs> So well, you can, but it's going to get expensive, right? Yes. And loud. Yes. <laughs> yes, that's right. We need an on-off button in a group that's situation. Right. If you don't have an off button, it's a bit of a disaster. So uh, if a combination of group and private is fantastic, and I know there are a lot of teachers who do run the occasional group lesson, but even just coming together to perform for each other, hmm. that addresses relatedness. I did a pod. Yeah, I did, I did a podcast um, earlier on with uh, Laura Kaha, who's a teacher in Sydney, and she uh, it was all about creating community through uh, group events. So she most of her teaching is one-on-one, -on -one, but she does these regular events, which were just so exciting for kids, and the parents loved it, which is also very important. Um, make sure you check back to that episode. Uh, we'll make sure we pop a link to that in the show notes because it's quite relevant to what we're talking about today. Interestingly enough, as you were talking about group teaching, uh, I noticed one thing that would become harder again with group teaching out of the three basic needs we're talking about is the autonomy in regard to repertoire choice because I guess the whole group has to choose the same thing. So whereas you might pick up on relatedness, you might lose a little bit on the, the autonomy, do you think, or are there other ways that you get that autonomy? Yes, there are definitely other ways to get the autonomy. Um for example, in my group classes, we are very rarely all playing the same piece at the same time. We're doing ensemble playing. Mm. And so I'll play them a three or four part ensemble and then they get to choose which part they want. Or we have a little try of each part and then they choose which part they would like to play. Uh, so um, I think in group teaching, we want to address the benefits of actually being in a group. There's no point in trying to give a private lesson to a group. If we're doing group teaching, we want to do group activities. So do part singing and ensemble playing and actually um, really uh, exploit the benefits of having more than one person in the room having having a lesson. Mm. Um, but before we you know, go down the road of the benefits of group teaching to private teaching or the other way around, uh, even in private lessons, um, that autonomy 
can be restricted if the teacher is making all the decisions, obviously, mm. or if the parent is making all the decisions. Um, and and sometimes also students make silly choices. So they might come into their lesson and they're a beginner and they say, I really love Beethoven's Waldstein Sonata. Right. This will, or this will often happen with adult students who make poor choices because they don't understand the limitations of their own technique. So when, when I say it's important for for students to choose their own repertoire, I mean that they should choose from a variety that we let them choose from. Yeah, so uh, it's not a free-for-all. It's like here are three great options for you. Which one would you like to do next? Yes, that yeah. is so important. Play them a few pieces and get them to choose which one they like. Just them having a sense of control over which piece they're going to play next uh, makes makes all the difference in whether or not they're going to practice that piece. Mm. And having said that, if they do choose something that's just a little bit too hard for them, it can be a fantastic motivator to progress quickly. And uh, sometimes it's not inappropriate to let them choose something that's too hard, even if we just do a little bit of that piece mm. or a simplified version. Um, so, you know, um, Diane Heidi, the fantastic pedagogue in the US, she uh, did a blog about um, – basically about autonomy and choosing what you want. And she gave the analogy at the beginning of her blog of somebody who's learning to cook and right. somebody who decides to go and have cooking lessons and the chef says, okay, why have you come here? And the person says, it's because I really love jambalaya and I want, I want to learn how to cook jambalaya. And the chef, i.e. the teacher, says, oh, oh, that's interesting that you want to learn to cook jambalaya. That's okay. But first, we must learn to cook my three cheese souffle. <laughs> and then the person says, but I don't like cheese. I don't like cheese souffle. Doesn't matter. You must learn to cook the three cheese souffle before you do anything else. And lo and behold, that person's not particularly, loses interest very right. quickly because even the end result's not somewhere where they want to be. Mm. So uh, we have to choose something where the end result is at least uh, halfway appealing yes, for our students. Totally. Well, I mean, I the reason I practice, and I've recently uh, did a video on Facebook Live about my new practice routine. I've been trying to get back into it this year with an hour and a half each morning, and I do it before anything else because it's the only time I'll ever do it. Uh, the and, and the the music I love to play is music that I've always wanted to play and is is beautiful sounding and appealing to me. I know that when I was doing my diploma, and that was only seven or eight years ago. Uh, I I love the music, but after a while, <laughs> any music that you're producing at that kind of a level gets pretty tedious, and I just couldn't wait to finish it up so I could try something new. So, the the choice of repertoire is so so crucial for students, and and I'm a big supporter of your um, method of playing uh, various pieces for students and letting them choose one of those, knowing that any one of them will achieve what I want for the student uh, regardless. Um, and I, I, in fact, sometimes I think it's a, a mistake also by the same token to start the year with a whole lesson of the teacher playing a whole lot of music um, and much better to, well, one, not do that in the first lesson. But when it comes time to choosing repertoire, uh, what, what do you think? I, I quite like sending my students to some links on YouTube to cut down that lesson time that's spent demonstrating and choosing music, I'd much prefer they send me a link to say, oh, I love this one. I saw it on YouTube and I've given them a list of the ones um, and then we can get started straight away. Have you tried doing that before? Yes, absolutely. I think uh, it's so – YouTube is just the best thing ever mm. for, for music teachers. Uh, to be able to send them away to listen to things – uh, is brilliant, and the only thing we we I think are obliged to do a little bit as as piano teachers is just curate a little bit <laughs> what we're sending them away to listen to. Because if, if if we're asking them to choose between say a couple of Debussy preludes, they might be looking up some shocking seven year old performance <laughs> of a Debussy <laughs> prelude, and then of course they're they're not going to make great decisions based on those recordings. So I think it's great if we can source the good recordings for them mm. to listen to, but send them away to listen to them never, nevertheless. And, uh, then yes. I, and I've learned that if you've got adult students, don't send them videos of 10-year-old kids playing these things brilliantly. It doesn't matter how brilliant they are. Oh, it's just yes. such a downer for them. <laughs> so, yeah. Yes, it absolutely is. But nothing beats watching your teacher demonstrate things. It's true. It is true. Yeah. Just don't spend yes. a whole lesson doing it, I guess is what I'd be saying. 
Now, a quick word from our sponsor, Casio Electronic Music Instruments. As many of you will know, if you've been listening to the podcast for any length of time, I've been trialing out the Selviano Grand Hybrid Piano in my studio, and uh, it's now become my main teaching and my own practicing instrument, and I've got to say that I'm thoroughly enjoying using it. Uh, Of course, many of you will know the benefits of a hybrid piano, um, including things like uh, the recording functions you've got, the choice of different sounds, the fact that students or yourself, you can wear headphones while using it, you don't need to pay removalists to move it around your studio or house, and the fact that it never needs tuning and obviously limited maintenance. So they're all fantastic, but how does it actually sound and feel to play? Well, pretty amazing. Uh, And I really, I'm not a concert pianist. So to me, this is absolutely as good as a full length, normal acoustic grand piano. Uh, And it does have all the wooden keys and the normal mechanism you'd expect. So what I would really recommend you do is head to soundtechnology.com.au to find out where your local stockists of this instrument are and uh, go and test one out today i really believe that you'll find not only is it a fantastic instrument but it's also at a price point that really sets it apart from its competitors now i was thinking um and we'll start wrapping things up in a moment i was was thinking in regard to the competence uh level we're talking about not too easy not too hard and i have a feeling this is where some teachers go wrong either by their own means or through parental pressure of pushing kids through exam after exam after exam. And Elisa Milne calls it being on the exam express. Uh, And uh, it's, it's a terrible situation because students only just ever make the exam. Maybe they get a B, oftentimes a C, and then it's bang, it's onto the next hardest level. And so that issue of competence and mastery, they almost never experience because everything is at the absolute limit of their their playing ability. Have you come across this as well? Absolutely. You've hit the nail on the head. That's the, that is the issue. They never get to experience mastery because they're constantly aiming for the next level. They've only just mastered something at one level and then they're going to the next level. It's wonderful to be able to play a whole range of pieces at a certain level and experience mastery. Now, We've all seen in recitals, you know, uh, great Perlman and Baron Boy, they'll come out and play, say, an encore for their recital, and it'll be something that's on a fifth grade syllabus. It'll be a beautiful rendition of um, Fur Elise or The Girl with the Flaxen Hair or something like that, um, which is which would be deemed as far too easy for them, but they would practice that piece just as they would um, their the Prokofiev Third Piano Concerto. Um, in fact, Moskovsky said that he practiced Chopin's A major prelude for 20 years mm. before he was happy with it. It's it's 16 bars long. So uh, that just because something is supposedly an easy piece, easy in inverted commas, uh, you can still go a long way to achieve mastery with that piece. And to play it beautifully is so... Um, it, it gives you such a sense of pride. And yes, I think when students are pushed through too many levels, they never get to experience that sense of pride and they never get to experience the thrill of performing something and feeling so fantastically on top of it. Mm. So this is where what they need, what students need, um, it are short-term goals and long-term goals. So short-term projects and long-term projects. So in the in selecting repertoire, Yes, we want students to choose what they're going to play, but from a bank of repertoire. And then to explain to them that some of their pieces are going to be short-term projects and some are going to be longer-term projects. If they're all long-term projects, that's where the boredom can set in and you never get the mastery. And the short-term projects obviously will be easier pieces, but this is where it's really important to explain to students why they might be doing that, that piece. This is where relatedness comes into it because if the, the piece doesn't address their competency, they'll think, why am I bothered doing this? It's too easy and they won't put the effort in. But if we can even just give them one little reason why, like learn this little piece because your staccato technique needs working on or this is fantastic for developing your pedaling, which you're going to need in that concerto or um, even to say learning these three pieces really quickly is going to improve your sight reading. It needs to go up a notch. They need to know why they're doing what they're doing and have a sense of purpose in achieving it so that it takes them away from thinking, oh, this piece is too easy. 
Right. Yes. And, and, and I love giving students all level, different levels of pieces, particularly easier ones that they can quickly learn. I call them one week pieces. Um, but I'm not always necessarily good about telling them why, except for it's going to make you a better reader. It's introducing you to different genres, all those kinds of things. So I think I could learn a little bit from what we've said today about the relevancy, uh, sorry, the relatedness um, aspect of the uh, three basic needs we've talked about. Um, and I think in, in a way to summarize, what you would be recommending is that as you choose goals, and most often goals are pieces, I guess, for, for many teachers, think about those three basic needs and whether you're able to um, capture them some way. So autonomy, competence, and relatedness for each of your goals, if you're covering those things and at least aware of them, chances are the student may be more engaged. Is that a simple way to summarize that? Absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, a really good way to uh, summarize it is just to remember the letters R, G, R. So um, we have R for rewards. When we're giving rewards, we also want to address the three psychological needs. We want them to feel like they have a, a sense of um, control over what what like even say would you like a sticker or chocolate you know they can have autonomy in choosing the type of reward they would like or mm -hmm. you could say what goal would you like to work towards this year so um rewards and goals need those three psychological needs to be need to be addressed so the first r is rewards the second the the g is goals mm -hmm. short-term goals and long-term goals and also not necessarily for every goal to be a performance goal mm, we totally. can have non-performance goals we can have composition and improvisation and analytical and listening and sight reading goals so they're not always necessarily performance uh, and then the second r in rgr is the repertoire right. if we we have to get the repertoire choices right that is essentially what is going to keep our students learning piano. It doesn't matter how fantastic the teacher is. It doesn't matter how supportive the parent is. If they don't like the pieces they're playing, they won't want to play. And I've got to ask this question because I know people are going to be thinking it. What about when you start a piece and the kid decides they don't like it after a little while? Do we let them off or do we grind them into the ground? You must learn this. Yes, that is a really good question. In fact, it's the, the fourth seven deadly practice excuse. <laughs> <laughs> so it is that I don't like those pieces anymore. I, call, I say that with, with this, most often what's happened is the honeymoon period is over. Mm. So um, if the student has selected that piece because they love it, then there's reasons why they don't like it anymore. And it's usually to do with the fact that they realize it's going to take a lot more work <laughs> than they thought right. and um, and sometimes that's an overscheduling issue they haven't got the time to practice it so if there are unavoidable reasons of or, or maybe technically it it was the wrong choice maybe it really isn't working out for that student so when they say I don't like it anymore it's up to the teacher really to try and figure out well, why aren't they liking it is it simply a matter of lack of practice because if it's lack of practice, they'll work through it. Once they've achieved it, they will love playing that piece. So we've got to break it down for them, I think. Mm. Um, if it's a technical issue, maybe just do part of the piece and maybe put it in the freezer and defrost it next year and do the rest of the piece. <laughs> nice analogy. Yeah, I think, I think we need to be flexible when it comes to these kinds of things. And certainly, you know, just grinding a student through a piece for the sake of we must finish this piece because we started it, it you know, it, it's not often the best way to go but uh, as you've said just trying to consider the, the background behind why that's the, the the struggle has come up I think is really important and often you're right it, they love the piece but suddenly realize oh my goodness I'm gonna have to put a lot more work in than I thought and that's okay and that's when we can push them along a little bit more well Samantha it's been such a pleasure having you on the podcast and thank you so much for giving your time for not just one but three highly engaging and really vitally important discussions for today's piano teachers and I know that many teachers around the world will have benefited greatly from these ideas um, have we covered everything that um, that you'd like to share I, I think I've just kind of drained every good good idea from <laughs> you I feel like it anyway I think we have covered everything yes I can't 
sick of anything else right now. Oh, it's great. And, and it has, it's, it's made me think about things and I know that uh, our listeners will have been um, challenged by some of your ideas and given some great strategies moving forward too. So for people who, uh, who love you and want to find out more about you, which I'm sure is everyone, where can they go online? Okay, well, they can go to my website, which is blitzbooks.com. That's B-L-I-T-Z or Z, B-O-O-K-S dot com. Uh, they can, uh, there's a blog. My blog is on that website and there's information about um, all the other resources I have on there. Uh, or people can email me at samantha at blitzbooks.com. Great. And, um, yeah, I'm, I'm good on email. I like getting emails. <laughs> uh, and um, a quick, quick wrap for your books too. You've obviously got, you know, you've you've recently um, headed into the UK market uh, with some of your theory books. So um, just tell us really quickly um, about what you offer, and in case teachers are interested in that too. Okay. Well, yes, the Blitz Books catalog consists mostly of theory books and sight reading books, and they are available in the UK. And people in the US can get them. You'd have to order them through musicroom.com, and that means it's coming out of the UK. Um, the sight reading books are applicable all over the world. There, uh, There's no specific syllabus that they follow, and the idea is that you can be a really terrible sight reader and then go through the sight reading course that I've written and be a fantastic sight reader at the, in the end. Uh, and it uses rewards carefully. There are uh, yeah, stickers the little, the keys, and right? feedback. Yes, the yeah. key, the key stickers. Yeah. They work quite well, um, especially with teenagers. Teenagers love stickers because they don't get <laughs> them funny? anymore yeah. at school. They don't get them. <laughs> Um, so, uh, theory and sight reading, the theory, uh, obviously addresses certain syllabuses around the world in Australia, there's the Australia, the AMEB and in the UK, it's ABRSM, right. but theory is theory. A scale mm. is a scale. And the idea of the style of Blitz books is that they are very user-friendly and informal, conversational and informal mm. so that it engages 21st century students mm. more. Absolutely. And uh, I can hi highly recommend all of them, uh, in, in including you didn't mention the general knowledge book, which I have also enjoyed. Oh, thank yeah. you. Yes. That, that was, was a, a newer one. That is, yes. That's so a reminder, that's at Blitz with a Z in the middle or a Z, blitzbooks.com.au. Sorry, was it? Uh, you can just do .com, .com. But there is a .au. It doesn't matter. Right. Either one will get you there. And I think I'm right in saying that uh, if you want to see Samantha speak live, she and I will both be attending the MTAC conference in Orange County at the end of June in That's California. Right. And for UK listeners, we'll both be in London as well. We will. I think by the time this goes out, they will have missed that opportunity, but they can definitely oh. have. <laughs> anyway, I'm sure you oh, always yeah. share your uh, your um, coming speaking events uh, and let people know about them. So I'm looking forward to hanging out with you over in uh, California. And thanks a million. I really do appreciate it, your time today and oh, over the last three weeks. <laughs> Thanks so much for having me on, Tim. It's been great. Pleasure. Thanks. See you soon. Bye. Well, there you have it, everyone. That was the last in our three-part series with Samantha. I do hope you've enjoyed it and got a lot of value from it. Uh, I, for one, am going to be going back and listening to it again. I'm not a huge fan of the sound of my own voice, but uh, for the amount of content and the great ideas that Samantha has uh, shared with us all, I think it's worth me going back. So perhaps you'll feel the same. Remember, of course, that you can easily listen to any of these episodes, any of the 124 episodes now, in your pocket, on your app, regardless of whether it's an iPhone or an Android, just download the Tim Topham app uh, and voila, all your podcasts, your favorite blog posts, your videos, Facebook lives, everything will be in one great spot. All right, on to our reminders before we finish up this season. Uh, firstly, happy holidays to those of you in Australia. We're just about to embark on a couple of weeks off, uh, well earned, I'm sure, by teachers uh, all over the place. And uh, for those of you in the United States, I know that you'll be starting to wrap things up uh, in the next uh, couple of months before your summer break, uh, but perhaps not quite yet. <laughs> I'll see a number of you as well at the West Australian Piano Pedagogy Convention. This is one of my favorite events. It happens every two years, and I'll be over there speaking in Perth, if you're a Western Australian, from the 6th to the 8th of April this year. So come along. Uh, I'm not even sure exactly what my topics are going to be as I record this now, but don't worry, you'll get a lot of value from them, and uh, it's a great chance, of course, to meet up. 
Now also stay tuned in April because I'll be releasing a course that has been uh, requested so many times by people who are following the things that I'm doing. It's of course my course on, of course my course on GarageBand and how I use that in my studio. It connects in so well to ideas like my four chord composing and the work that I do on pop music. It's just a brilliant app. It's free on any Apple device. It's like, why wouldn't you use it? Well, people wouldn't use it because I don't know how to. So I'm actually going to be releasing a full course on that with videos, screenshots, showing me uh, using it and how I use it with my students to get the most out of their creativity when it comes to um, fun composing. So stand by for that. Uh, that's going to be released and I will do a webinar to uh, explain more about it and share some ideas. Well, this is the last episode of season one, 2018, as I said, so we haven't got anything coming up next week. Thanks very much for listening, though. If you've enjoyed this episode and any of the ones in the season this, uh, this year, then please do take a minute to leave a rating or a review on iTunes or Facebook. I really do value them. I read them all uh, and they mean a lot to me. Uh, so if you're able to do that, then uh, you can actually head to timtopham.com slash iTunes. That'll give you the instructions for that. Uh, and on Facebook, just head to my Facebook page and press the review button. There's also one other place where I would love to read a review and it will mean that my app shows up in more places. If you could review my app, if you're a user of it, uh, then that would be so awesome too. Uh, I, that, that would mean a hell of a lot to me because at the moment it's like blank reviews because we've only released it uh, at the end of last year. So if you can jump over to the App Store and review that for me, wow, I will be forever indebted. Thank you so much in advance. So we'll be back at the start of May for season two, 2018, where we'll be discussing a few of these topics. So marketing and Facebook advertising will play a prominent role. We're going to have a look at recitals and ideas around performances. Uh, also um, exploring a little bit more about rock bands uh, and some of the cool things that people are doing with those. Uh, and also early childhood teaching. We've got a number of uh, great guests to interview about early childhood topics. So um, stay tuned for that. I can't wait to release it again. It'll be in around about May. Uh, and until then, enjoy every bit of your teaching and I wish you all the best. It's Tim Topham here and this is the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. Enjoy the break and I'll see you in season two. Ladies and gentlemen, that will conclude this evening's entertainment. Oh, thank you. Thanks for listening to the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast. We'd love to help take your teaching to the next level as a member of our supportive community. Use the coupon Piano Podcast for $100 off an annual membership of Tim's Inner Circle today. To find out more, head to timtopham.com forward slash community.